All right, let me invite you in to find your seats tonight. Great to be back here with you. Night number two of our summit conference. If you need a summit conference notebook, raise your hand up high. Team members are coming by to pass those out. If you need one, maybe it's your first night here with us or you lost yours since yesterday. That's fine. Uh, team members come by to pass those out. If you need one, raise your hand up high. All right, as we, again, think about these first 30 minutes every evening, we're spending time talking about relationships. How do we grow in our relationships? How do we invest in those marriages God has given us, those family relationships, our church family relationships as well? Again, as we talked about last night, the key to that at the bare foundation of it all is to um, make sure that we're putting on Christ-like love. I love this picture from Ephesians 5. It's where we're going to be tonight. Just a reminder of the text we talked about last night. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So we have to remember that our example to us in this journey of our relationships and putting on Christ-like love is being imitators of God, walking in love, remembering how Christ has first demonstrated his love for us, giving himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. So we're going to spend time tonight again unpacking that further. Uh, tonight and tomorrow night, it's kind of part one, part two of a, a two-part uh, time of this message. Um, we're going to be tonight talking to the men in the room. What does it look like to be a man of God in the world today? Tomorrow night, we'll talk to the ladies. Uh, Maggie and I will be up here together sharing what it looks like to be a woman of God in the world today. So tonight's uh, time for men. We'll have some application for the ladies as well. Tomorrow night, we'll be focusing on uh, the women, and we'll have some application for the men in the room as well in that. Now, growing up as a child in the 80s and 90s, there were a couple of uh, examples that culture was telling me about what a man of God, or, or not a man of God, a man in the world were to look like. A couple pictures for you here. Uh, let me know who, if you recognize these individuals. Who's this guy? John Rambo, right? Okay, so you guys are well-versed in the action movie uh, genres. I mentioned last night I love action movies. I enjoy the Rambo movies, but uh, the reality is that John Rambo may be a great example on the battlefield, uh, but not a great example in the area of relationships, okay? Here's why. Here's a, a definition for what the term Rambo means. Uh, Rambo is used commonly to describe a person who is reckless, disregards orders, uses violence to solve problems, enters dangerous situations alone, and is exceptionally tough and aggressive, okay? Pretty good description, right, of John Rambo if you've seen any of those movies. Again, great on the battlefield or in action movies, but not so great of an example when it comes to our marriages, our families, or even our church family relationships. Here's another example of what culture was teaching me of what a man uh, was to look like. Who's this guy? Homer Simpson, okay? So I've not watched a lot of Simpsons, but I've seen enough to know that uh, a good definition or description of Homer Simpson is this. Um, he is a crude, bald, obese, short-tempered, rule-neglecting, clumsy, lazy, heavy-drinking, 
ignorant and idiotic person, okay? Pretty good description, right, of, of Homer Simpson, if you've seen any of those episodes at all. Again, not a great example to us of what it looks like to be a husband or a father or an active member as a man in our churches today. And I use those two examples for this reason. As I travel around the country and as I think about my own life, I meet men all the time. And I've noticed that there's a common thread through all that. Inside each one of us, sometimes there's a little bit of John Rambo and a little bit of Homer Simpson. And if we're not careful, if we're not following Christ's example, if we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, uh, that's kind of what we default to. We're either really uh, exceptionally tough and aggressive or really uh, lazy and um, not wise and we're uh, self-centered in those kind of ways. So we have to be very intentional about that. Now, thankfully, we don't just have to look to culture uh, to define what it looks like. We can actually look to God's Word for that. So we're going to be doing that tonight. Ephesians 5, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. Pages 21, 22 in your Summit Conference notebook should be some places to take some notes there this evening. I'm calling this message Courageous Leaders. I think that's what our calling is as men in our homes, in our families, in our church relationships, uh, in our places of influence. We're called to be courageous leaders. Again, Ephesians 5 is where we're going to be. If you've got your Bible, you can follow along with me here in a moment. I want to start here with verse 21 because it's important to understand this conceptually as we talk about these uh, roles and, and um, ways that we live out God's word in these uh, being a man and a woman of the world today, uh, to look at this first part of Ephesians 5, uh, verse 21, as a guiding principle for us. Ephesians 5, 21 says this, we must first submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Again, le- recognizing and laying ourselves down, taking an appreciation and interest in the things that interest others, being servant-minded, being humble, that's what Christ-like love looks like. We have to continually, in our relationships, no matter what we're called and defined to be as men and women of the world today, we must start with this understanding that we have to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ and for what he's done for us. But if you've got your Bibles, we're going to continue on, verse 22. Again, the subheading here is uh, the relationships between wives and husbands. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of this body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she respects her husband. So you're going to see all throughout these texts that we talk about these next couple days, there's a lot of loaded language that culturally has gotten misunderstood, sometimes in church life misunderstood, but we're going to just take time to get back to what was the real meaning and intention behind these passages. But all throughout this uh, section here, talking about what a husband's role is with his uh, wife and with his family, it's clear that we're called to lead. There's no way around that. Scripturally, as men, we are called to lead in our homes, in our families, in our marriages, in our churches. That is our uh, responsibility to be, um, as the term here is um, leadership, the term that we see in Scripture sometimes is headship, and that can sometimes create problems because there are things culturally that we uh, apply to that that may not be exactly what the writer Paul here was intending when he wrote this. Sometimes when you hear this word that the husband is the head of the wife, these kind of things come to mind. Somebody that's an authoritarian, or a boss, a ruler, an owner, or maybe a president. Those are terms that evoke very strong emotions. That's not exactly the kind of terms that Paul was implying when he used that term headship. Here's what he would have meant. Protector, provider, lover, and responsible for. Words that would be described as life-giving. That's our calling in our marriages, in our families, in our churches. We're supposed to be life-giving, laying our lives down for others. That's what the kind of leadership that we're called to provide. So a couple of ways that leadership looks uh, throughout this passage. I think, first of all, we're called 
to lead by pastoring, by providing the right kind of direction and pace. So it's so important for us in this journey of caring for our wives, caring for our families, that we are providing the right kind of pastoral direction for those responsibilities. We see that through language like this. We are to sanctify her, our wives, washing them with the word, presenting them holy and without blemish. Now, I don't know about you, but that can be pretty intimidating for me at times as a guy. I don't have a theology degree, so the thought of pastoring and and sanctifying her with the word are things that can kind of uh, lead me to feel intimidated sometimes. But the reality is this is what I've realized on this journey. In my own life, and as I've talked to men all across the country, all it really takes to lead your wife or lead your kids or lead your church is to be a man who's seeking after God in your own life. Doesn't matter where you're at on that journey, how far along you may be, as long as you're a man that's increasingly moving and growing in your relationship with God, you can provide the right kind of leadership because you're giving the right kind of direction. What does it mean to give that spiritual direction? It means that you establish priorities by simply giving instructions and directions. Again, sometimes that can be intimidating, but I know in my life and a lot of guys I meet, we're pretty good at giving directions. Okay, even just today or the last couple of days, here's some instructions or directions I gave in my house, okay, with my kids specifically. Do this, don't do that, come here, eat your food, brush your teeth, get dressed, make your bed, don't pout, stop sitting on your brother's head, okay, those kind of things are the kind of directions and priorities that we're establishing in our homes. Same kind of thing can be done in a spiritual connotation in that leadership Role. We're establishing the right kind of priorities. We're giving direction. In our truck, when we're traveling all across the country, I'm often telling the kids this, be calm, be kind, and be quiet, okay? That's really important, okay, when you're traveling with six of you in a small little semi-cab pulling your house behind you. I think about that passage uh, that Joshua was saying about his family, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Establishing the right priorities is what that right pastoral direction looks like. It's having the right kind of family values where you're teaching them to love God, to work hard, that your family comes first, to tell the truth, to love your neighbor. One of the best indicators for that, I think, in our world today of what our priorities really are individually and what our priorities may be for our family are what our calendar looks like and to look at our bank accounts. Those two things give a pretty good indication of what's important to us, the direction that we're going the way that we spend our time, and the way that we spend our resources. Some of the times that I find myself not wanting to provide the right kind of direction is because I'm afraid of getting lost, okay? Again, I drive a big semi-truck. I'm afraid of getting geographically lost. But some of the time, my, my own spiritual life is not doing super well. I'm not seeking the Lord. And so I'm afraid of getting my family off the right track or on the wrong track. And so I, I refuse or I, I deny the kind of leadership that God has called me to do in my own life. But all it takes, again, is to establish and think about where is the direction of my life headed? Am I seeking God with my life? Are my priorities reflecting that, the kind of thing that can be modeled and followed after by my family? That's what spiritual direction, pastoring, and that kind of leadership looks like. The second one is to lead with the right kind of pace. A picture for you here. You wouldn't think to look at me now, but back in high school, I ran cross country and track. Um, if you saw me try to run even across your parking lot right now, you would think that was pretty hilarious, okay? Because I have not gotten in that habit of running like I used to uh, back in the day, but um, I was never a very competitive runner, okay? I had translated all kinds of competitive things to lots of sporting activities, but running, I just enjoyed the group that I got to do it with. The team that I was a part of was, was phenomenal. I was never super competitive on the cross-country uh, course or on the track, uh, but uh, there was this one race at the end of my freshman year, a big conference race, and uh, me and another guy that were kind of end of the pack runners had a, had a great idea. We were going to try to confuse the other team and make them think that all of a sudden our high school got some elite cross-country athletes. So we uh, began that race, and we started off running as fast as we could right out of the gate. And it felt great because about the first half a mile, we were in the lead. That didn't happen very often or never for me, so I was feeling pretty excited about that. The problem was cross-country race was 3.1 miles, okay? And I was running at a pace that I could not maintain. And by the end of the race, I ended up very far in the back with one of my worst times of the year. Here's why I share that story. So many times in my spiritual life, I've looked at other people, other families, what their family devotional life looked like, what their relationship with their spouse looked like spiritually. And I've 
I've wanted and desired that, which is a good thing, but I would try to set a pace that I couldn't maintain, that my wife and I couldn't maintain, that my family couldn't maintain, because I was looking to, around me and comparing to others instead of realizing and asking God what was best for us. I've realized that there's really hard when you've got four young kids to have a robust, long devotional time. We've had to adjust and make some changes there. It's important in our spiritual pastoring leadership role that we don't just provide the right direction, but that we're aware of and paying attention to the needs of those around us. Where we're at spiritually, where they're at spiritually, and providing the right kind of pace for that leadership. What does that look like in our home? I think some of the times if you are not uh, initiating some of those things, a couple of baby steps you can take is just to start praying out loud with your spouse or with your kids. It's talking to them about spiritual things. It's not trying to crack open the Bible and read three or four chapters at a time together. Sometimes it's just a baby step of just praying or talking about spiritual things or a small little devotion time can make all the difference if you're not already starting on that journey. Second step of calling to lead is by also providing a physical and emotional needs as well. We have to provide those things as well. That's our responsibility to lead, not just in the spiritual needs pastoring, but also those physical and emotional needs. We see that in verse 28. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and he cares for it. Those are provisional terms, just as Christ does the church. Again, this expresses, guys, our responsibility as husbands, as fathers, as leaders in our churches to make sure that we're caring for those needs of those around us, providing for their needs emotionally and physically. 1 Timothy 5.8 gives us a clear instruction on this. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Sometimes we can, though, get so focused, making sure that there's uh, food to eat and a, a roof over our heads and clothes to wear, that we neglect the other parts of those relationships that are sometimes even more important. What's going on in their souls? What's going on in their hearts? Paying attention to those parts of them as well. Again, provision physically is so, so important, but that emotional piece and the spiritual piece is, is uh, uh, just also incredibly important uh, for those things. That provisional piece physically means it is our responsibility. It doesn't mean that wives can't work outside the home or can't contribute economically. We'll talk about that tomorrow night as well. But if your family does not have the physical needs to survive, there's something that we need to do as leaders to change those decisions that are being made. Things that need to be going more, giving more initiative to making sure the provision is there or where the expenses are reduced. It's our job to make sure that those physical needs are provided for, but also those emotional and spiritual needs are so, so important. Uh, we did an event up in St. Louis, Michigan, not too far from here a couple years ago. I met a guy named Justin. This is his testimony that he shared with us. I think, when I think about my own life, a lot of guys I meet, this testimony is so true of where I find myself so often. I'm a husband and father of three. My focus has been on providing financially for my family. Over the past few months, I have realized that I am failing them spiritually. Growing with you and your team has shown me some needed strategies that I can use to better myself with God and my family. I've only been able to cope so far by myself. And that's the key. Sometimes we get so focused on what we can do and we're not relying on Christ's example or his word or his spirit to guide us. I know I need God and support from others to become the type of husband and father that I want to be. Thank you for all that you do. If you're struggling in these ways, Greg's message tonight on pride and humility will be huge for you. And then recognizing that sometimes like, you just need to ask God for his help. You need to find other guys that you look up to in this church or in your spiritual community and say that there are ways that I see you leading your family, I need to grow and learn from you. Learning from others is so, so important on that journey. So again, the clear calling to lead is, is evidence in this part of scripture, but I also love other places as men were called to lead. But how we lead is just equally as important. It's not just that we're called to lead, how we do it is so, so vital in this process. We're called to lead in love. Verse 25 through 31, just make that abundantly clear. A lot of the things we talked about last night, putting on Christ-like love, if that's not the foundation of our leadership, the rest of it will crumble pretty quickly. How do we do that? What does that leading in love look like? First of all, I believe uh, it means that we have to elevate again by putting others first. We spent a lot of time unpacking that last night, but we have to recognize that others' needs 
Our wife, our kids, or our fellow church members, their needs have to come before our own. Verse 25 just again says this, that um, husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Their interests, sometimes at our expense, that term gave himself up is like saying he handed himself over to. Here's my life. What can I do to serve you, to love you? What do they need and what can I give? And again, how far does that go? It goes as far as Jesus took it, all the way to the very end of our lives. Expending ourselves for these that we're called to lead by doing that out of love, elevating by putting others first. It's also by cherishing, by embracing individuality. Again, verse 28, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. That expresses an understanding of what's really going on inside each one of us uniquely. I don't know about you, but I thought I would marry somebody that was a lot more likely than I, like me than I really did. All right, that differences list last night, okay? Maggie and I keep learning every day pretty much. There's something different about us that we never knew the day before. Now I have four kids. I kept thinking like maybe one of these kids will turn out just like me, think like me, act like me, I turn out like me. The reality is they're all very different. Not only are none of them like me, none of them are like each other either. I've had to pay, pay specific attention to their individual needs, desires, the way God has uniquely created them to impact the world around them. We have to take an interest and appreciate those things that our wife or our kids or those that we're called to love are interested in, again, even if it's the opposite of those things that we enjoy. And we might find in that journey that you actually wind up liking those things too, but we have to understand each of those people God has called us to love. It's not the same process or the same uh, just solutions to, to love them well. Each one needs individual attention to pay attention to those things that make them uniquely wired. Third way we lead in love, we have to pursue uh, with time and attention. Again, nobody uh, hated his own body, but nourishes and cherishes it from verse 29. One of the things that's obvious to me, being married now for 15 years, having uh, been a dad for 12 years, is that relationships require time, and that's just not in the same space. That's actually focused, concentrated time. And the number one thing, even still today, and I've talked this now a hundred times, and I'm convicted about it every time, because I haven't made the adjustments I need to, but the thing that keeps me from actually spending the quality time with my kids is this device right here. Something designed to help me to stay connected to people actually keeps me from investing in those people that matter the most to me. We have to be very intentional to recognize that being in the same space with somebody is not the same time, uh, same thing as actually spending uh, a, a real amount of uh, time with them. Relationships require time, focus, concentrated time. Again, it's not just being in the same space, but actually paying attention to what's going on around them. Finding time to put aside those devices, asking their curious questions, getting to know what's really going on inside of them is so, so important in pursuing those relationships, those people God has called us to love. Now, I know when we think about those terms, elevating, cherishing, pursuing, those don't feel like real manly terms, okay? So I recognize that, but I've realized on this journey that we as men are often pretty good about some of these things, about actually uh, putting an interest in, in other things, of cherishing things, of, of putting in the time and attention to details that requires things to become and grow and and turn into something amazing. And so um, a few examples for you here. I don't know if anybody in here likes to garden or grow things, all right? The, if you do, here's what you've realized. That that plant requires a certain amount of sunlight, of nutrients, of water, of time and attention to the specific details. A bean plant and a tomato plant require very different things. And so you have to invest the right kind of time and attention into that to see that become uh, the right kind of plant and produce the way that you want it to. Same amount of time and attention can go into our areas of relationship. Maybe you like to play golf or some other uh, athletic hobby. I realize I'm not a very good golfer. Here's why. I don't spend enough time on the golf course. I don't take enough time critiquing my, uh, my drives or my short game or my uh, putting or anything like that. I, I don't spend the time on the course to grow in those areas. But if you're good at golf or any kind of sport activity, you've realized like there's a lot of time that goes into that. Paying attention to the unique details around every part of that game and, and the intricacies involved in that. That same kind of time and attention can be directed into those relationships that you feel called to love to see it become fruitful and the best thing that it can be. Again, maybe it's not one of those two areas. Maybe you just like to build things, work with wood or other materials, craft things with your hands. You know what it takes to take that piece of wood or 
that material from where it began and make it into something functional and beautiful. Same kind of attention and energy can be put into your areas of relationships. Maybe it's not one of those areas, but you've got a big old truck or a fast car or a motorcycle or a boat. You know how to make that thing look good and sound good and run good, okay? That same kind of time and energy and attention that you put into that vehicle, that boat, that car, whatever it may be, to make it look good and run good, the same kind of effort and intentionality can be directed to your marriage, to your kids, to your church community. That's what leading in love looks like, paying attention to those little details, investing the time and energy it takes to see it become all that God intends it to be. So again, leading in love means that you elevate, you cherish, and you pursue. Meg is going to come up here for a minute. We're going to share a word for the women in the audience tonight. How can you come alongside your husband or um, the men in your life to help them become who it is that God intends them to be? Three areas, and then Meg is going to share her thoughts with you. First of all, what you can do is you can support their God-given leadership. Their calling to lead you as, you, their, as your husband, um, as, your, as your husband is, is so, so vital. They need your support and your encouragement. I'm letting you know a little secret. Like, they already know where they're failing. They don't need a lot of help as men. We don't we often need much help recognizing where we're falling short. But we do need somebody to encourage us and to support the areas where we're growing. Maybe you're married to somebody that's not a believer. Maybe there's somebody that you're burdened for that you want to see grow into this kind of uh, Christ-like uh, man in your life. Remembering that you're not their Holy Spirit. Allow God for, to move and work in their life. Pray and ask God to begin that work in them. When you don't know what else to do, you can always pray and ask God to move and work in their life. Maggie, what would you like to share tonight? Yeah, I just would like to confess that I tend to be, um, especially as a wife, a very prideful and judgy person. Does anybody else admit maybe to that? So I'm pretty gracious to myself. And I'm pretty gracious to others, but for some reason, man, when it comes to Brent, I'm like, I know exactly what he should do all the time, and all he needs to do is ask, and I'll, I'll tell him how to live life, and it would be really great. So, um, but obviously, that's not a fun person to live with, you know? And so the Lord's convicted me a lot of times, what do I do with these expectations? Because I came into marriage, I don't know where we get them, but women just carry around expectations. We're like loaded with them. I don't, I don't know how we get them. But I asked my mentor one time, I said, okay, so what do I do with my expectations? Because I don't know what to do with them. Like, apparently Brent doesn't like me strangling him with them. So she said, okay, Maggie, here's what you can do. You can write all your expectations down on a piece of paper. And she said, you can hold that piece of paper so tight and you can shred Brent to pieces until he measures up to all the things that you think he should be doing. As she said, or what you could do is you could shred your paper and you could begin to love and accept Brent right where he's at and just pray for him and encourage him and be a cheerleader for him. Not that we don't challenge him in love, but not from a place of judging us. So uh, the Lord speaks to me through nature. I told you guys I love uh, the outdoors. And so one day I was praying I was really discouraged. I was like, God, why do we do this again? Like, stay married to the same person for a really long time? <laughs> Can you explain the point again? And um, the Lord was so sweet, and he, he showed me this little chrysalis, which is, as you know, there's a little caterpillar. It begins in the world looking entirely different than what it's going to become. But in order to become what it's meant to be, it has to ha have a safe place. And that's what a chrysalis is. A chrysalis is a really safe place for it to just form and become, and the Lord said to me, Maggie, that's what marriage is. It's a, supposed to be a safe place so that you can love each other unconditionally and so that one person can fail and they still get to be loved. And um, they're not beat up all the time. You get to love them. Not that we don't, again, challenge, but we do it in love, unconditional love. And so that's my encouragement to us is... Um, Lord, what do I do with my expectations? I'm still trying to figure it out. Surrender them to him and, and accept this person who's my best friend. And then um, become a safe place where someone can grow and become, and they, but they always get to be loved. Thanks, Meg. One final quote for you here before our Life in Action Challenge tonight. When I think about um, examples in culture that have led well, so I look to 
uh, political leaders or governmental leaders, one of the guys that comes to mind uh, that was a great example of leadership was a guy named Winston Churchill. And I think this quote is so applicable for me in my life when I recognize again all these areas where I still got room to grow, where I feel like I may be failing and where I need God's help. Winston Churchill's quote for us, he says that success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. Guys, if you think tonight, like you're going to get this all right, and from here on out, you're going to be perfect in your roles as a husband or as a father, as a leader in this church, like you're not going to get it all right. There will still be failures along the way, stumbles along the way. The key to growth in this journey is to not lose the enthusiasm, not lose the goal of Christ's example for us, recognizing that God can empower us through his spirit to actually become the kind of men that God intends for us to be that make an impact in our homes in our churches, in our communities, in the world. Here's your life in action challenge for tonight. Before you go to bed tonight, and we give you that caveat because by tomorrow morning, things will get busy, okay? If we don't do it tonight, if you're like me, you'll probably forget, okay? And uh, our, rec- our encouragement to you is to take one of these two steps tonight. Uh, you may be already doing the first one, so we'll give you one for those that may be more uh, further along in your journey. Here a moment. First of all, it's this, that you will pray with your wife out loud. Some of you have maybe not done that in a number of years. Some of you maybe never have been able to. The biggest impact you can make in your marriage relationship, I guarantee you, this week, is to simply pray out loud with your wife. And you maybe go, like, I don't feel comfortable praying out loud. I don't even know what I would say. Here's as simple as it can be. I guarantee you, if you have not and are not regularly doing this, this can mean all the world to her. Just reach your hand over and grab her by the hand and just pray this simple prayer. God, thank you for my wife. That'll mean the world to her if you take that step. If you've got a bunch of kids, and the next time you see your grandkids, just take time to pray with them. You'll provide incredible encouragement in that process. Second step, I would encourage you to take this step as well. Ask your wife or, or the person that you want to love the most this question, what can I do to help you feel more loved and cherished? And now, guys, don't ask that question and then do nothing with it, all right? That's very dangerous territory, okay? If you ask the question, be willing to take action in that way, make some adjustments there. One final testimony for you here, the importance of these basic simple steps. We met Daryl in Baytown, Texas, oil mining community. This is what Daryl shared with our team. I had stopped praying with my wife some time ago, one of the biggest mistakes I've made, but God grabbed me by the seat of my pants, gave me a swift kick. Don't we need that every once in a while, guys? Told me to pray for and over her. It is my duty as a godly husband I started doing so on Monday, and I've seen it glow about her ever since. My 10-year-old Abigail prayed with me for the first time, and it broke me. Starting today, Diana and I are starting a couple's devotion together, and I'll be praying with Abigail every night at bedtime. He didn't go into that night intending to start a couple's devotion or pray with his daughter every night. He just took one simple step, praying with his wife that night, and things began to change. Praying with his daughter, things began to change. What is that one step God would have you to take? I'm going to pray for us here before we invite the kids in for worship. God, there are still areas in my life where you know that I am not leading in my marriage or my family well. Areas of praying and and having spiritual conversations and uh, guiding uh, my family with your word. And so I just ask that you would help me. I ask you to help the men in this room to take steps of obedience tonight praying out loud for our wives, for our kids, for our grandkids, and then taking the intentional time to ask those questions. What can we do to help them feel more loved and cherished? God, I believe that if we get behind this kind of lifestyle and our leadership and our responsibilities and our relationships to God, that will change a church. It could change an entire community. It can change the world. So God, I pray for the men in this room tonight that they'd be willing to take some of those steps of obedience tonight and they would see you move and work in power through it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have kids in Happy Heart City or Base Camp, stand on up. They'll be coming in those back doors. Give a wave to them so they can find you. And we'll have a time of worship here in a couple of minutes.
church. Go ahead and stand with us as we worship.
I love it because it lays out the truth of the gospel from starting with our spiritual desperation without his sacrifice for our sins, the liberating death that he willingly gave for us on the cross, and then leading to the gracious freedom that we have through his resurrection when death was arrested and my life began. So as we sing this song, Listen to the words, and once you're ready, proclaim it with us. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy
recognize that tonight. God, we were alone in our sin, dead in our trespasses, but God, you arrested death and you conquered the grave, and God, we are alive in you. You have set us free. You pour your endless love on us. God, we are so very thankful for that. God, we praise you tonight. It's your name that I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good evening again, church. Great to be back here with you. Thank you, worship team, for that great message and music tonight. 
Before we send our kids out, I want to let you know about an exciting resource that our ministry has available for you guys. These are our Base Camp Adventures audio dramas. These are available anywhere you listen to podcasts or on our Life Action website or through our Life Action app. These Base Camp Adventures audio dramas just follow the uh, stories of Piper and Man Jack Moore parents, the great teaching content that they're getting this week available through those resources as well. And so just check those out. AJ, you and I are competing for getting that slide back up there, I think, man. Throw that Base Camp Adventures one up there, man. Thank you. Nope. 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 Yep, there we go. All right. Round of applause for AJ, everybody. <laughs> Technology is always our best friend and our worst enemy, isn't it? Okay. So, again, great resource for you parents. Even if you have kids in Happy Heart City, uh, some of the content on there would be geared for their age as well. But check those out. Again, lifeaction.org on our Life Action app, anywhere you can find podcasts. Three seasons of that available. More seasons coming out in the future as well. All right, kids, we are going to send you out now. If you're in Happy Heart City, three and a half to first grade, your teacher in the back back there waving at you. Have a great time in Happy Heart City tonight. Man, great turnout of kids on a Monday night. Good job, parents, getting them here. I think there's more kids tonight than last night. Awesome. Base camp, second through fifth grade. Mr. Ben's in the back back there waving at you. Have a great time. Those in base camp tonight. Exciting things happen in clubs tonight. You're going to want to be down there. But Greg's got a great message for us in the room tonight as well. All right, just a reminder, again, about our ladies' luncheon coming up on Thursday, 1130 to 1. A free event for you, but we do need you to sign up. There is a sign-up sheet in the back. Be thinking about who you can invite to come be a part of that time. Maybe there's a coworker or a neighbor that you've been trying to figure out how to invite them to events here at your church. This would be a great opportunity as Maggie and Pag Patty pour into you during that time uh, if you can just come for 30 minutes, I believe that would be a blessing to you. Uh, ladies every week tell us that their revival moment happened at that ladies' luncheon. So again, sign up in the back. Child care provided. Bring a sack lunch for them. Uh, but come Thursday, 1130 to 1. Also coming up on Saturday is our Home Life Cafe, 9 to 1. Again, market calendars for that. We'll be talking more about that, but an event for your entire family coming up on Saturday. You can download our Life Action app. Again, if you're watching online, we're going to welcome you tonight. But if you're in the room as well, Lots of great resources on that app, things to help you in your devotional life, uh, video teaching resources, blog content as well. But check that out. If you're watching online, some of the prayer cards and other resources we'll be talking about, you can find in that Life Action app. Download it from the App Store or Google Play. Click the Events tab and you can engage with us. If you need a Summit Conference notebook, raise your hand up high. I know I passed them out earlier, but if you need one tonight, your first night here, or you lost yours between our last session, all right? Uh, raise your hand up high. Team members can get one of those into your hands tonight. Final opportunity, just want to remind you to be able to think about how to share your story of how God is working in your life. I hope when you drive home from the church every night, you're having conversations in the car with your family about how God is speaking to you. I'll be thinking about how you can have conversations in your neighborhood, in your workplaces, uh, throughout the day as you interact with others, but also think about how you can use social media to be able to do that. Uh, as you do that on Facebook or Twitter, somewhere like that, you can use the at Life Action Hashtag that allow us to see how God is moving in your life as well. Greg's going to come now, introduce us to a new segment of our services tonight. Thank you, Brent. It is good to see such a good group here tonight on a Monday night, day two of our eight-day conference. If you're sitting on the right end of one of those rows, reach down, get that basket, grab a prayer card, pass it down so that everybody in your row has an opportunity to get a prayer card. We we're honored to pray with you yesterday, last night, and throughout today, today, and we'll continue to pray with you. Whatever God leads you to uh, share with us, we'll covet with you, covenant with you to uh, pray and seek God's will in those directions. Remember also that we have a prayer room designated for the summit. Right out the back doors, just a few steps down the hall, first room on the right, you'll see the sign, prayer room. And remember my challenge to you last night that we begin to live out our definition of scriptural obedience, doing what I'm told to do, when I'm told to do it, with that right heart attitude. No such thing as delayed obedience. So at any point in the service, God is speaking to you, and you know that you need to respond. Go ahead and gather your things quietly, slip back to the prayer room. Team members are there to pray with you if you desire, or just find your spot and camp out. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Greg, if I get up and leave during the message, some of my blanks won't be filled in on my page, and that's going to drive me crazy. I understand I'm wired that way too, but this is important. 
Why would you expect God to share with you more truth when you've not been obedient to the truth he's already given to you? See, there's a principle here. God's not going to give you more truth. You can sit and listen and take good notes. But if God has already spoken to you and you've been unwilling to respond, you're already walking in disobedience. All right, as Brent mentioned, we're going to add a new segment to the service for the next few nights. We're going to take uh, just a few moments each night and do what I describe as a, a mini message. And it's going to be on the general topic of living a generous life. Now, what I'm going to do is take us through a book of the Bible, 2 Corinthians 8, just a few verses at a time. You can turn there, or I'll be putting verses on the screen here in just a moment. Now, someone's thinking, wait a minute, Greg, you said this is a revival journey, and now we're talking about giving. Are they related? Absolutely. We talked yesterday, what are the characteristics of God's reviving work in our lives? A new desire for intimacy with the Lord beginning to see the character of Christ on more consistent display in our life, a, a new desire to obey the Lord, uh, a new uh, interest in reconciling relationships and deepening and strengthening relationships, and then another unmistakable evidence of a deep work of God is a birth of generosity, a new birth of generosity. We get excited about investing our time, our talents, our financial resources in kingdom ministry. Now, before we jump into the passage, let me give you a quick background. Paul was the founding pastor of the church there at Corinth. He had come to them and shared with them that there was a desperate need for ministry funds back in the mother church in Jerusalem. There was a famine, there was persecution, so God had put upon his heart to challenge the daughter churches up and down Greece to collect an offering Paul would then receive it and take it and deliver it to Jerusalem. So when he asked the Corinthians, are you in? All the hands went up. Everybody said, yeah, we're in. Months have passed. The time is drawing near for him to come and receive that offering. But he's hearing reports from the church leadership. They've lost their enthusiasm. And this is a glaring fault in their lives, in their spiritual maturity. There is a bent toward greed there is a bit toward selfishness that's afflicting that church at Corinth so he's obviously writing to encourage them to grow in this area of generosity so let me just read a few verses we want you to know brothers about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia for in a severe test of affliction their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part now pause he wants to motivate them to get more committed in their giving, and he does so by lifting up the example of a sister church. Macedonia was a, a different province. The churches there would have included the church at Philippi. Paul says, I've just received the offering there at Philippi, and I want to describe to you their attitude toward giving. Now, it's interesting. He puts words together we don't normally put together. Severe test of affliction an abundance of joy. They too were being persecuted. Extreme poverty, we know from uh, uh, historical records that there was a, a deeply depressed economy there. Extreme poverty, but a wealth of generosity. What a whole different attitude about giving. We have here a tale of two churches, a very generous church, the church in Macedonia, and a selfish church, the church at Corinth. Listen again to this description of the church in Macedonia. They gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. I get this uh, sanctified imagination every now and then and start kind of seeing how maybe things were, were, were uh, lived out in these passages. I can see Paul, he arrives there, the church in Philippi, the elders come, they give him the offering, and they just pour those coins out on the table. And you can almost see Paul saying, oh, no, this is too much. I know your circumstances. I know your challenges. This is too much. And he says, they literally begin to beg me, Paul, don't deprive us. Don't deprive us of this opportunity. Now, Pastor John, like you have officiated many offerings over the years, I'm going to acknowledge that there has at times been begging the congregation wasn't begging, I was doing the begging. But here's the congregation begging Paul, let us participate. Now, why again such radically different 
attitudes toward giving. And ironically, that church in Corinth was a very affluent congregation, a port city, a very affluent congregation. Why the different attitudes in giving? We see it in verse 5. This not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. They understood in Macedonia, giving doesn't start in the wallet, it starts in the heart. It starts with an acknowledgement that all that I am and all that I have belongs to the Lord. So that brings us to our first living, giving principle. You want to jot this down. I gave you a page number earlier there in your book or just find a page. You're going to ha end up with uh, about half a dozen of these living, giving principles when we're done. We call them living, giving because... We want to weave these into the rhythm of our lifestyle. We want to uh, incorporate generosity into all that we are. Before you give any of your material possessions to God, he first wants you to give yourself. God is far more interested in you than in any gift that you might bring to him. His priority is you and your heart. All of us are born with a spiritual disease. The Bible calls it sin. Early in the life of a child, we begin to see symptoms of that spiritual disease, symptoms of selfishness. They're cute, but don't forget, they're cute little sinners. One of the first words they latch on to is my or mine, right? My room and my toys and my bike and my phone and my car. So we grow up with this me mentality that all this is my stuff to do with as I wish. And then we have this collision with the gospel. According to Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, you and I, never having lived in a culture where lordship is practiced, it's difficult for us to understand this concept of lordship. We haven't lived in that kind of environment. If somebody had the title of Lord over you, that meant they could come at any time, take anything you had, and you had absolutely no recourse or appeal. In other words, lordship equates with ownership. When you confess that Jesus is your Lord, you're confessing his ownership over all that you are and all that you have. I'll end each of these sessions with just a series of questions. You're learning we like to ask questions. Has there ever been a point in your life when you fully gave yourself to God? I'm not asking about a salvation experience necessarily or joining a church or being baptized. I'm asking a point at which you simply said, God, all that I am and all that I have belongs to you. You literally crawled upon that altar to say, God, all that I am, all that I have belongs to you. Have you completely surrendered your will, your desires, and your plans to God. It's not just what you have, but what you hope to have. Not just who you are, but who you hope to be. Have you surrendered all of those things to the Lordship of Christ as well? Have you sometimes found it easier to give your material possessions than to give yourself or your time to minister to others? It was easier to give a gift to God. It was easier to give something, a token to God than to fully embrace the concept of lordship or to give something as precious as your time. Have you transferred ownership of all your material possessions to the Lord? Let me give you a little exercise that I think will help you. Take your keys out. Pull them out of your pocket, out of your purse, your keys. I want to hear the jingling of those keys around the room. All right. Now, if you think about it, those keys kind of represent your stuff, right? The, the, especially the, the big things. For instance, you got a house key on there. Who owns that house? You say, well, mainly the bank right now. I understand, but your name is on the mortgage. Who owns that house? God owns that house. Thank you, Lord, for letting me live in your house. Thank you for letting me enjoy these clothes. Thank you for letting me enjoy that big screen TV. Thank you for letting me enjoy this furniture, God. Thank you for letting me live in the house that you own. Again, I may live in it, but God owns it. Find you a car or truck key on there or SUV key on there. Now, I want you to see how freeing this really is. Again, whose 
vehicle is that it belongs to the Lord. And this is a great freedom. See, the next time you come out of Walmart and some knuckleheads put a big old scratch on your car, instead of pitching a hissy fit, you step back and you just say, Lord, would you look at what they did to your car? Lord, they didn't even leave you a note. Get them, Lord. No, 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 no. But do you see how freeing this is? So every time you just hold your keys, whether it's a house key, a, a car key, or, or a boat key, or whatever that key represents in regard to your possessions, remember who that belongs to. I was leading a conference outside of uh, Flint, Michigan, some years ago. It was a little bit bigger uh, auditorium than this, and I was right before the service, I was over here, and uh, I'd been preaching on these principles of generosity, and a uh, Man came up to me and said, you know, God's really challenged us to be more generous. There's a family in the church. He's out of work. They're hurting. We want to give them a gift, but we want to do it anonymously. Would you give it for us? I said, I'd be thrilled. He pointed out the man on the other side of the room. So I walked over and said, uh, somebody in obedience to God's prompting wants to share a gift with you. And I was able to give him that envelope. I could tell it was thick with cash. Now, I want you to know that was very easy for me to do. See, it's not hard for me to give somebody else's stuff away, right? But here's the point. It's all somebody else's stuff. We've got to make a, a, a mental correction. Get over this idea that you're giving your stuff to God. No, I'm simply managing what God has entrusted to me, obeying his prompting as his spirit leads. Pastor John, come give us a word of welcome tonight. Again, get those prayer cards ready. I'll call for those in about five or six minutes. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming. It's great to see so many people here again tonight. Uh, so many things already on my mind. I, they, they've, they've created this little slot for me to come and fill each night. And each night, I'm not quite sure how to fill it. So... So I had some thoughts uh, earlier, and then you went and did what you just did. So then I uh, wasn't sure whether I should still bring it out. One thing I do want to talk about, though, we have a number of people who are participating on the stream. And uh, Brent had talked about uh, technology and how it's uh, either really uh, helpful or, or, or the opposite. And we are not currently able to get a lot of the slides and such, or any of the slides, up on the stream. We have these booklets available, so if you're taking part on the stream, or maybe you're going to be uh, home, well, those of you here already have booklets, but we're going to have a stack of these here at the church. If you need one, would be helpful to have one at home, uh, please stop by the church and uh, pick one up. And um, are Brent and Maggie still here? I guess not. The, what, what Brent was talking about as far as uh, fathers, it, that it really resonated uh, with me. Uh, the things Maggie shared as well, but just two thoughts came to mind um, that, that I would add. One is, it's been amazing to me through the years, both in my own experience and in the lives of other men, how much God does with just a little obedience. It looks like a, it is a huge, huge job, but he is so gracious that when you take a step of a little obedience, he does amazing things with it. So I just wanted to share that as an encouragement. Uh, the job might look huge, but it's kind of like power steering. You know, you, you do a little bit and, and the power takes up over and it does a lot more than, than what your own strength does, a uh, little obedience. Uh, so that's an encouragement, especially to the younger uh, husbands and fathers. But to the older ones, another thing comes to mind, and that is that your, your children, uh, they're always looking to you. So you might have already raised your kids, they might live on the other side of the country, but they're still watching you, and they're still affected by the decisions that you make and the example that you set. So it, you're never past that point where you can uh, really be, um, and God wants you to be, uh, a very direct uh, influence for him in their lives. So it's worth saying. All right. So let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then Greg will come and bring his word again. Father, we thank you for this time that we have and for uh, your living word. We thank you for the way that it uh, it's always fresh again whenever we come back to it, even if we've come back to it a thousand times, uh, because it's alive. 
And uh, we pray that your living word would be alive uh, throughout the rest of our night, that you would uh, anoint Greg as he uh, comes to deliver that word, and that your Holy Spirit would work inside our hearts and minds. Uh, as you said, Lord, that it will never fail to accomplish the purpose that you had set for it. And so whatever that purpose is in us tonight, Lord, we pray that your word would accomplish that purpose. For your glory and our good, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us. As we rehearsed this song earlier today, I kept thinking about the story of when Jesus went to dine at a Pharisee's house, and it calls her a woman of the city, a sinful woman, learned that he was there. And so she came, she brought her alabaster flask of expensive ointment, and she came in weeping. She fell to the ground and she washed Jesus' feet and dried them with their hair. And the Pharisee thought to himself, doesn't Jesus know who she is? Doesn't he know that this is a sinful woman? And so Jesus used that opportunity to teach him that those who have been forgiven much, love much. Friends, we may have a different past than this woman, but we have all been forgiven much. I was convicted um, just thinking about this story, knowing that even though it doesn't have to be the posture of our physical selves, but it should be the posture of our hearts in worship, um, that we should be falling at Jesus' feet, filled with love and adoration and worship. And so I just challenge you to think about that story as we sing this song. Think about um, just what he's done for you.
travel across the country to worship with congregations. Sitting up here at the front, I have that advantage of getting to hear your voices behind me. You're a good singing church. I can tell that you've been taught well in that regard. I want to remind you, though, that every worship service down here really is just a dress rehearsal for that great worship service up there. The Bible promises us that we shall behold him. And when we see him, we'll be like him. Imagine someday singing to the face of Jesus with a voice that's actually worthy of the praises that he deserves. So continue to practice hard, church. Team, thank you for that message in music. Pass your prayer cards to one person on that row and you collect them, hold them up. Team members will come by and pick those up. Just keep waving until we see you. Quick video here for the message tonight. We cultivate humility when we see ourselves in light of who God is. John Owen once said that two things are needed to humble us. First, we must consider God and his greatness, glory, holiness, power, majesty, and authority. And then we must consider ourselves in our mean, abject, and sinful condition. You see, humility means to seek his grace by admitting our own great need and throwing off our own self-sufficiency and bowing prayerfully before our Lord. James 4, 6 says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Which side of that fence are you on? Well, I'm always curious to see who comes back on Monday night, especially after a challenging Sunday. You came yesterday morning, two hard-hitting messages. You came back last night, two more hard-hitting messages, and then I made you sit there and complete that complete spiritual exercise. Uh, some of you feel like this young man right now. You're already just hanging on for dear life. <laughs> Hang in there, okay? As we've uh, stated several times, our desire is to experience the reviver. Not to experience revival, some mystical or emotional experience, but to experience the reviver, God's presence and power in new and fresh ways. He is sovereign in those regards. We can't produce revival. However, we can posture ourselves, position ourselves by acts of obedience, by responding to God. We saw yesterday the responses of obedience and honesty. We add tonight a beautiful picture, a beautiful piece of the puzzle, the response of humility. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. I don't have an easy way to get you to 2 Kings, so detour through that table of contents if you need to. It's right behind 1 Kings if that helps at all. Workbook is on page 10, Cultivating a Humble Heart. Let's say you and I were talking before the service and you said, Greg, What's the topic tonight, the biblical principle? And I said, well, I'll be honest, I'm going to hit pride pretty hard tonight. Now, you probably wouldn't say it out loud, but you'd be thinking, oh, man, I sure hope so-and-so comes tonight. That person, he needs to hear, she needs to hear a message on pride. Now, let me start by saying most of us don't think of ourselves as struggling with pride. And the reason we don't think that way is because we have a very narrow, stereotypical idea of what a proud person is like. Now, I mentioned to you yesterday that I'm a native Texan. As I travel across the country, I find that a lot of folks uh, equate Texans with, with pride, you know. They think of us as kind of loud and boastful and arrogant. So I love to be able to set the record straight. That's exactly how we are. I'm sorry, you know, that's just, that's just how, how we are. We've got so much to be thankful for and proud of. I heard about a Texas businessman in California on a business trip, and they were having a, a business dinner, and in typical Texan fashion, he began to boast about how the steaks were juicier in Texas, and how the, uh, the, the servers were prettier, and the football players were tougher, and he got up eventually and excused himself to go to the restroom, and one Californian looked at the other, and he said, are you as tired of this guy as I am? He said, yeah, what are we gonna do about this proud Texan? He says, I've got an idea. I happen to have some prescription sleeping pills with me. They put a couple in his tea when he came back and he finished his tea. By the time they got him out to the car in the parking lot, he was sound asleep in the back, sleep, uh, back seat. So the guy says, now what are we going to do? 
He said, over where I live, there's a cemetery, and I noticed a freshly dug grave. We're going to have fun with this guy. So they took him, they laid him out on the grave. They walked away giggling. When that guy wakes up in the morning, he'll be one humble Texan. Well, sun comes up, he opens his eyes, obviously a little disoriented, and he kind of gets up to look around, get a lay of the land, and then not to be deterred, he crawls out of that grave, sticks his arms up, and proclaims with his loudest voice, praise God, it's resurrection day, and a Texan is the first one out of the grave. <laughs> Now, we're going to see that uh, pride can look very different than that stereotypical view. Your revival truth tonight, the revived heart is turning from pride and embracing humility. And we're going to divine, uh, define both of those words scripturally here in just a moment. Let me build a foundation first. Let's talk about understanding humility. If you want a relationship with God, you must come to him on his terms, which means humbling yourself. God desires a relationship with you. Sadly, we have the audacity to expect God to come to us on our terms. The king of the universe will not bow to you, my friend. That's not what he's going to do. He wants a relationship with you, but you and I, we have to come to him on his terms. And one of those terms is we must humble ourselves. Uh, a passage that's uh, widely connected with God's reviving work, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Read it with me out loud. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, someone says, Greg, but that was a promise to ancient Israel. I agree. But in that promise to ancient Israel, God includes principles. God is providing a way for them to return to him, to reset themselves spiritually, knowing they were going to drift, knowing they're going to wander. How do they return to the Lord? We're talking about some of these things, to pray, to seek his face, repentance, turning from our wicked ways. But notice the first step in returning to the Lord, humble themselves humble themselves. Second thought, humility is not thinking less of you, but thinking more of God and others. This is going to be our working definition of humility. Sadly, we have poor concepts of humility. Humility is not having a poor self-concept. Humility is not weakness or cowardice. Humility is not becoming a doormat to enable the sin and selfishness of others. That's not humility. Humility is not really about you, but rather thinking more of God and others. We base that on a verse that Brent shared with us yesterday, Philippians 2.3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Why is humility a big deal to God? Why does he require us to humble ourselves? Well, first, God himself is by nature humble. Remember our working premise yesterday? What I believe to be true about God is going to have the greatest impact on my lifestyle choices. My actions will be in response to what I believe is true of God. Because God himself is humble. He expects us to humble ourselves. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said of himself, I am humble. Philippians 2, 8, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Now, one more thought before we jump into the text. Humility does not come naturally or easily. You're not born humble. Humility is not your default. We're going to see that our default is actually pride. That's why the scripture commands us to humble ourselves. In obedience to God, in response to understanding his humble nature, we're to humble ourselves. So we're going to read about a man tonight who had to learn to walk the road of humility. But oh, what a change it wrought in his life. 2 Kings chapter 5, I'll start reading at verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, 
but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. She worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Now pause just a moment. What do we learn uh, about Naaman here in the passage we just read? Well, in verse 1, we're introduced to Naaman as the commander of the army of the king of Syria. Now, a quick geography lesson. Even as it still exists today, Israel and Syria are neighboring nations. At this time in history, the time of Naaman, God was allowing the Syrians to dominate the Israelites. It was an act of judgment, an act of discipline because of their willful disobedience and a fondness for idolatry. So Naaman is leading these raiding parties into Israel. He's described as a great man. Now, that could be a reference to his physical stature. Ancient warfare was pretty brutal stuff. You had to be a pretty tough, stout guy to survive, much less climb the ranks. Maybe he was one of those men, though, who was just a natural leader. One of those men that others were just eager to follow. Regardless, Naaman has done extremely well in his chosen profession. He's risen to the top of his career ladder. He's now the commander of the entire army. Leading these raiding parties has made him uh, tremendously wealthy. Again, in verse 5, we have a description of that wealth. 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold. That would equate to about $3.3 million by today's accounting. I think if Naaman was living today, Naaman would be probably the epitome of the all-american success story uh, probably starts you know as just one of the recruits in the ranks but he rises up the ranks he pulls himself up by his own bootstraps and now he's incredibly successful if he was living today he might be quarterbacking a, a, an nfl football team he may be the ceo of a fortune 100 company who knows everything's going naaman's way by all of our metrics of success, he's ticked them all off. And then one day, he finds something. It's almost like a passing comment there in verse 1. But he was a leper. Again, my imagination, my sanctified imagination kicks in. He wakes up one day and there's that gray ashen spot on the back of his head. You know, like most guys, he just kind of rubs it, doesn't think much about it. A couple of weeks later, it's a little bigger. And finally, at the nagging of his wife, he goes to his doctor. Diagnosis, leprosy. Prognosis, death. He's watched people die of leprosy. It's a slow, lingering death. The leprosy attacks the extensions first, uh, uh, the arms, the legs, literally eating them away. And finally, death comes when it attacks the vital organs in the core of the body. Now Naaman is in crisis. Let me just pause for a moment and make an observation. And again, I don't know who this applies to, but I know people. There's someone here tonight and you're in a crisis. Maybe like Naaman, you've had some bad medical news. Maybe you're having to face down cancer or some other uh, very serious type disease. Maybe for you it's a different kind of crisis. Maybe it's a financial crisis, loss of work. Maybe it's a relationship crisis, a struggling marriage, a rebellious child, a broken friendship. Maybe it's a personal crisis. You're struggling with uh, disabling emotions, uh, destructive emotions, fear, anxiety, bitterness, lust. You've prayed, you've cried out to God for deliverance. But deliverance has not come. Why? It's entirely possible that God has orchestrated circumstances in your life to allow this to afflict you for the purpose of teaching you to humble yourself. To humble yourself. Embracing 
humility. Number one, we're to identify the characteristics of pride in our lives. Look down to verse 9 with me. Still in 2 Kings, verse, uh, 2 Kings 5, verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry. He went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in a rage. Now pause. Again, Naaman seems to have a soft side to him, an endearing side. He's got this uh, girl that uh, he captured. She's a slave in the house. But again, he seems to have this endearing side, and she's concerned for her master and believes he can be healed. There's a prophet back in my hometown of Samaria. His name is Elisha. And if we could just get you to Elisha, I think he could cure your leprosy. And again, he goes to the king and he gets permission. So Naaman pulls up in front of Elisha's house, and he's making a statement. He's got this, uh, he's not going to travel by himself, he's too important. He's got an entourage, he's got soldiers, he's, they've got horses. He's got this wagon full of gold and silver. Now watch, Naaman always gets his way. Either he bullies or he bribes, but Naaman always gets his way. Now I know Naaman is struggling with pride, and the reason I know he's struggling with pride is I see an outstanding characteristic of that pride. It's mentioned twice. In verse 11, we're told that Naaman went away angry. In verse 12, he went away in a rage. Why was Naaman angry? He was angry because he wasn't getting his way. See, he had made this important statement to Elisha with his soldiers and with his fortune there. Either I'm going to bully your bribe and I'm going to get my way. Elisha's not playing. Elisha's not cooperating. Elisha wouldn't even come outside and meet him. He sends his messenger. We found out later a man named Gehazi. And the message that Gehazi delivers is very insulting to Naaman. Hey, Naaman, you, you, you see that creek over there? I know the Jordan River, the most famous river in the world, but a lot of places it's little more than a muddy creek, honestly. Oh, you see that? We call that the Jordan. The prophet says if you go and dunk yourself seven times, you'll be healed. That's not what he expected. That's not what his plan was. Elisha is not cooperating. Let me hit pause for just a moment and ask you this question, because I care about you. What are you angry about? You say, Greg, how do you know I'm angry? Well, I don't. You have your church mask on again tonight, but I know people. There's somebody out there, and you're very angry. You're filled with anger. And the same reason that Naaman's angry. You're not getting your way. Someone's not living up to your expectations. Someone's not playing by your rules. Someone's not going with the flow that you put out there. And you find yourself angry. It took me a while as a pastor to figure this out, to learn, and I'm still learning and growing. I'm sure your pastor's ahead of me. There are two kinds of sin. Fruit sin and root sin. Now, I spend a lot of time helping people chase around fruit sin. What would be fruit sin? Anger, lust, critical spirit, bitterness, unforgiveness. All of that is fruit sin. And they'd get a little bit of victory for a while, but then they'd go right back to it. Why? Because there was a deeper level they had not yet attacked, the root sin. And the root sin is is pride. See, it's your pride that's feeding your anger. You don't have anger issues. You have pride issues. Let me illustrate like this. You may have noticed my truck out in the parking lot, that big old F-350. The ministry owns it. They allow me to drive it. I pull my trailer around with it. Now, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with that truck. Most of the time, I'm very pleased. It's a good truck, performs well, but every now and then, I get that check engine light. Ooh, man, I hate that. I got to find a Ford dealer. 
It's going to be time that I have to put it in the shop. It's going to be an expensive fix. But every time I turn the ignition key, there's that check engine light. So I finally decide i got to do something about this. I go inside the trailer, I get a little piece of tape, and I tape right over that check engine light. Now I'm driving down the road carefree. You say, Greg, you wouldn't do that. No, I'm smarter than I look, okay? Now, the problem, hear me, the problem is not with the light. That light's just an indicator. Where's the problem? It's under the hood. See, your anger is really not the issue. Your anger is an indicator that there's something under the hood that's not right. A heart issue. Let me give you a couple of other characteristics of pride, all right? Uh, proud people, they live their lives independent of God. Independent of God. I see this everywhere I go. Our pews, our chairs, our churches are filled with people who are professing believers but functioning atheists. What do you mean a functioning atheist? Even though they profess to believe in Christ, even though they profess that God is in control, they live their lives as if either God is too weak to do anything or unconcerned. You know what their favorite verse is? God helps those who help themselves which, by the way, is not in the Bible. It's just the opposite of what the Bible teaches. They live their lives independent of God. Proud people are stubborn. Stubborn. They've got to have the last word. You can describe their parenting philosophy my way or the highway. Here's a woman. She's married to her husband. She's committed. I love this man. I'm committed to this man. I'm going to fix this man if it kills us both. Now, number one, it's not your job to fix anybody, but that's stubborn. Here's this father. He's got this girl that he, daughter that he loves, this girl that he loves, this daughter. I love this girl. I'm going to make this girl obey me if I've got to ground her the rest of her life. Stubborn. A third characteristic of a proud heart, self sufficient self-sufficient when this person is walking through a challenge a particular problem relationship issue there's this little voice in the back of their head that says something like this you can handle this you're an educated person you've done well in your chosen business profession you can take care of this and that is, in its essence, what our pride is. Independence, stubborn, self-sufficient. I've got a real quick movie clip. It's from an old movie, Shenandoah. Any Jimmy Stewart fans in the room? All right, you'll like, you'll like this. Now, he's living as a widower at the start of the Civil War. He'd made a promise to his wife to raise his children as good Christians, but he's having trouble with that. We're going to discover why. Let's watch. Lord, we... What I do? Well, it's what you haven't done, boy. A man eats with his hat on is going nowhere in a hurry. Now, your mother wanted all of you raised as good Christians, and I might not be able to do that thorny job as well as she could, but I can do a little something about your manners. Now, shall we? Lord, we cleared this land. We plowed it, sowed it, and harvested. We cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be eating it if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We work dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel, but we thank you just the same anyway, Lord, for this food we're about to eat. Amen. Now, you're laughing because it's not you up there on that screen. Let me tell you what I believe is the most repulsive expression of our pride in God's eyes. It's when we wrap our pride in robes of self-righteousness. 
and in God's name act out on our proud, disobedient desires. Mark 7, 21, it's in your book, so get your pen ready because I want you to circle a word as I read through it here in your workbook. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride. Circle the word pride on the page there. Circle that word pride. All these evil things, now circle the phrase, evil things come from within and they defile a person. What is God's opinion of my pride and your pride? He ranks it right in there with sexual immorality, murder, coveting, wickedness. God describes our pride as an evil thing. Why? Because it's my pride that put his son on the cross. Still at the bottom of the page there, Proverbs 11, 2, or wherever on the page. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. Circle that word disgrace. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. We disgrace ourselves with our pride. We say things, mean things, harsh things. We bully. And when we do acknowledge that, well, I shouldn't have probably said that, instead of humbling ourselves and seeking forgiveness, we just kind of sit there with a smug look on our face. That's pride. It was the pride, gentlemen, that you felt welling up when Brent was challenging you tonight to be a spiritual leader in the home, to do something as simple as praying with your wife. What was it in you that kind of rose up and said, I don't really want to do that? It's your pride. Proverbs 16, 18, again on the page, pride goes before destruction. Circle that word destruction. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Again, I don't know who this applies to. There are reputations in this room that were destroyed because of pride. You've got to understand, your pride is a wrecking ball. There are relationships represented in this room that were destroyed because of pride. Marriages that ended in divorce. Parents estranged from children. Why? Because of pride, our pride is a wrecking ball. I was leading a conference. Rocky Mount, uh, North Carolina. It was uh, the second Sunday night. We met with your church leadership last night. We're going to meet with them again this coming Sunday night to just uh, evaluate what God has done in their hearts and in your church. And one of the men in the room he was a deacon actually the chairman of the deacons at that time is an older man and he was really bragging on our saturday home life cafe that's coming up this saturday the family teaching seminar and he said man that was just great and he looked at the young guys in the room the young dads and husbands and he said man i hope you guys took good notes because i was not the father i should have been and i'm paying the price now he and his son were estranged. They hadn't lived in the same town, but hadn't spoken in years, had no contact with his grandchildren. Then he just kind of got quiet. And I said, brother, you know, as parents, we've all got our regrets. All wish we'd done different. But let me ask you this. Have you ever asked your son to forgive you? Just sit down with him and said, listen, I wasn't the father you deserved. I wasn't there like I should have been. And just acknowledge your shortcomings and ask him to forgive you. And he says, I've never done that. He says, but I'm going to. And he looked at the other men in the room, and he said, when you see me again, ask me. Hold me accountable. Well, I saw him the next night, big smile on his face. He said, I called my, hus uh, my, uh, my son at work, and I, I said, can I come by your office for just a moment? And his son rather reluctantly said, okay. And he said, I walked in the door, and I looked him in the eye, and I said, listen, God has really dealt with me about not being the father I should have been. I wasn't there for you. I wasn't the person that you needed. I, I wasn't the committed father, and I'm just acknowledging that to you now. I've let you down. Then he said, would you please forgive me? And he said, I watched my son's hard expression begin to soften, and his eyes got watery. Yeah, Dad, I'll forgive you. They embraced began a new season of relating together. I call that a bittersweet story. It's sweet because they reconciled. But the bitterness, the years that were lost, 
the years that were squandered because of pride. Now go back to that chart, proud hearts, humble hearts. Let's look at the other side of things. Again, trying to get our heads around humility. What does biblical humility look like? Dependent on God. Humble people cultivate a conscious dependence on God. Let me give you a little test. Here's how you'll know how dependent you are on God. How much do you pray? How much do you pray? Proud people don't pray. They don't need to pray. They got it all together. Humble people. They pray. They pray desperate prayers because they're so dependent on God. As opposed to a stubborn heart, a humble heart is a yielded heart. What do you mean by yielded? Well, again, you're driving along. There's that upside down triangle. Yield. What does that mean? If I and the other driver come to the intersection at the same time, I yield. I let them go first. I defer to them. The perfect example of yieldedness we see in Scripture, of course, is Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, is there any way to let this cup pass? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Contrasting with a self-sufficient heart, a humble heart is a Christ-sufficient heart. A Christ-sufficient heart. They take the promise of Philippians 4.13 seriously. I can do all things in and through Christ who strengthens me. There is this conscious dependence upon the Lord Jesus. Embracing humility. Number one, identify the characteristics of pride. Number two, repent of your pride and humble yourself before the Lord. Well, let's finish our story. I don't want to leave you hanging. Skip all the way down to verse 13 with me. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now pause. We pick up the story, and here's Naaman, and he's standing there by the river, and he's pouting. I know he's pouting because it takes a powder to know a powder, and I'm a world-class powder, okay? I'll just confess. He's mad. Humble myself crawl down in that muddy creek in front of all my men. He's not doing what I thought he should be doing. And again, he's got this endearing side. They call him father, a term of infection, fa affection. Father, he's said a great thing. He said you can be healed if you just go down and wash. All right, he's kind of watching, you know, make his way down the muddy bank, and he goes down and he comes up. And it's still there. He said seven times, okay. And he goes down that seventh time and he comes up. And it says that his flesh was clean. Clean like a little child. He's been healed. But don't miss the greater miracle. Not the healing on his hand, but the healing of his heart. What's his confession? He steps back up, looks Elisha in the eye, and he says, now I know there's no God in all the earth but the God of Israel. Now think about this. What would have happened had he allowed his pride to prevail? See, he was at a point of crisis. Pride or humility? He could have chosen pride. He could have climbed back in that wagon, ridden back, and died that long, lingering death. Let me ask you a question. What's your pride costing you right now? What's your pride costing you by virtue of your Christian testimony? What's your pride costing you by virtue of broken relationships? What's your pride costing you? What are you going to do about it? I mentioned to you yesterday that I hosted four Life Action events. The first was in the mid-90s. I was pastoring up in the Texas Panhandle, that top boxy section of our state. It was a 
kind of a county seat church, you know, a, a well-known church. I was a young pastor, very honored to be there, and uh, God was blessing. Now, your pastor had far better, worthy, far, far worthier mo motives than I did. There were just people in my church that wouldn't listen to me, so I thought, I'll bring this crew in and let them preach to them for a week, and maybe they'll straighten them out, you know, and about halfway through, God set his sights on me, and my woe is me moment came. We talked about that yesterday. Remember we saw how Isaiah had unclean lips? I had a secret sin. Unclean eyes. I was not guarding my eyes. I was not protecting my purity. And God got all over me, and I was broken. I sat down with my wife, and gentlemen, that's the first conversation you got to have. And I confessed to her, and she very graciously forgave me. A few days passed, and then I sat down with her again, and I said, I want help here. And I feel like I've got to share this publicly with our church to get the help I need. I said, now, I'm not sure how this will go. I'm not sure they're going to want damaged goods in the pulpit when this is over, but I, I just have to obey the Lord. So the Sunday after our summit, as I came to the end of my message, I shared with our congregation what I just shared with you. Then here's how I left it. I said, I'm going to walk back to our church parlor, and I'm going to wait there. My associate's going to come, and he's going to close the service. If there are any other men out there, and you're struggling, and you're willing to get honest with yourself and honest with others, begin to take the steps that are appropriate for repentance. Just come and join me in that room. And that was a long walk back to that room. And it seems like I was there an hour. It was just a few minutes. Then the door opened and one of my deacons came in. Gave me a big hug. Pastor, I'm struggling too. We're going to work through this together. And another man and another man. And before it was over, 65 men were standing in a circle. Many weeping. Getting honest with God. Honest with each other. And taking their first steps into moral freedom. Because I was willing to humble myself. God blessed others. This is our last verse tonight. And it, it's important because it serves as a bridge between tonight and tomorrow night. Read this with me out loud. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God's reaction to your pride, this is strong language too. God opposes the proud. One translation said God resists the proud. Gentlemen, I get that, uh, that uh, uh, trophy in my, you know, my head, that picture of the trophy there with the, the stiff arm out there. And there's this picture of God stiff arming the proud. God says, you, you don't need me? All right. I'll just let you go on down the road and then I'll check in and we'll see how that's working for you. He's opposing, he's resisting the proud, but watch. He gives grace to the humble. Now tomorrow night, quick preview, tomorrow night is grace night. It's my favorite message of the whole week. Don't miss tomorrow night. We had to walk through tonight to understand pride and humility to be in a place tomorrow night that we can experience God's incredible grace. Turn with me to page 28 as we finish. Again, on the back of your book, page 28. As we saw last night, we have these exercises in the back. The heart God revives. You see two categories, proud people, broken people. Now, I find this is most effective if you don't think long because you'll find yourself rationalizing and justifying your pride if you just simply get honest and respond as you're prompted by the Lord. So with pen in hand, proud people, number one, focus on the failures of others. Broken people, overwhelmed with a sense of their own spiritual need. Now, which of those statements best describes you right now? Put a check to the left or to the right. Which best describes you right now? Number two, proud people, a critical fault-finding spirit. 
look at everyone else's faults with a microscope, but their own with a telescope. Broken people, compassionate, can forgive much because they know how much they have been forgiven. Which of those statements best describes you right now? Check on the left, check on the right. Number three, proud people, self-righteous, look down on others. Broken people esteem all others better than themselves. Check on the left, check on the right. Number four, proud people have to prove that they are right. Or excuse me, number four, proud people, independent, self-sufficient spirit. Broken people have a dependent spirit, recognize their need for others. Again, check on the left, check on the right. Now look at me for just a moment. You did really well last night. You, you stayed and completed the exercise. I'm not going to ask you to stay tonight. We're mindful of bedtimes. We're so thankful to have those young families here. You're welcome to stay. Just like we did last night, I want you to leave quietly when you do leave so that those who want to stay, if you want to stay and complete it tonight, you're absolutely welcome to do so, but I'm not going to ask you to stay. I am going to ask you, though, to complete the exercise before 6 o'clock tomorrow night. Do it before you go to sleep tonight. Do it in the morning. And I want you to be thoughtful. I want you to walk through it. Now, when you're through and you hold that page out and you look at where all the check marks are, that's going to answer the issues. Do you have pride issues? And if so, are you willing to humble yourself? Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you that in your humility, you came to serve us. You healed us, you fed us, you taught us, you led us, you forgave us. You continue to do all those things in and through your spirit. You call us to the road of humility, dying to self, allowing you to overwhelm our pride so that we can walk in true fellowship with you. Have your way as we continue this journey together. Pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Again, you're free to stay as long as you desire. If you're leaving, leave quietly. God bless you. Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow night at 6.